All right, so first up we have number 66, the Annunciation Triptych, also known as the Marode Altarpiece. For form, you're going to have trifold panels. That means it can be folded up and taken somewhere, which means that it is considered portable. This is oil on wood. And for function, you have a religious worship for personal use in a home because it was not actually that big. For content, you need to know that Joseph is on the right-hand side, Mary and the angel are in the middle, and on the left-hand side is the patron and his wife who are looking in from the outside as a nod to the people who paid for it. Also, don't forget that since this is a Northern Renaissance work, you have a highly symbolic picture here, including a tiny flying baby Jesus who has broken into the window and is going to carry that cross inside of Mary's womb and impregnate her. This also has an attempt at linear perspective, which means it goes back into space, but it's not completely successful. It is highly detailed and anatomically correct. Next up, we have the Posi Chapel made by Filippo Brunelleschi. You do need to know that name, Brunelleschi. For form, you're going to have dome at the top with an oculus. This is made of stone and bricks. Stone is fine. Pilasters and muted tones. For function, this was a meeting place for monks. And for content, you need to know about the roundels, those round circular pictures in the back. Those were made of clay and glazing with clay was a very new technology, so it was super cool. We're gonna put it in our church here and we're gonna look at that, that's gonna be cool. This also has Corinthian columns, but they're not actually columns, so they're pil pilasters, which remember are decorative instead of using uh, for holding weight. For context, this is the very early Renaissance uh, religion and power of the patron, uh, of course, the Pazzi family, hence the Pazzi Chapel. Next up, we're going to have the Arnolfini portrait painted by Jan van Eyck, a master of the Northern Renaissance. For form, you have oil on wood panel. And for function, this was typically thought of as a wedding portrait, but now we think that it is an engagement portrait. It's important to remember that the woman on the right is not pregnant. That was just the style right there. And for content, this is also highly symbolic because we're going to see the Northern Renaissance has all of these things, and you can look that up. Uh, it also has an artist portrait in the back. If you look very close, you can see him reflected in a mirror back there, and also his signature that says Jan van Eyck was here. For context, again, remember Northern Renaissance and power of the patron. Next up, you're going to have Donatello's David, not to be confused with Michelangelo's David. He is five feet tall, which is only five inches shorter than I am, and made of bronze. For function, this tells a story, a narrative, and is highly symbolic. For content, you have a young David with Goliath's severed head at his foot. He is wearing a hat and boots and nothing else, oddly, and is standing in contrapposto that relaxed stance, which is the nod to the Greek and Roman style. For context, this as David was a symbol of Florence and also the Medicis. Remember that Florence is a city uh, had just won a great battle against somebody that was much stronger than them, and they identified with David as defeating Goliath. So again, that is the symbolism here. Very, very important. Also need to know that the patrons are the Medicis. Next up, we're going to look at the Palazzo Ruccioli, or the Palace Ruccioli, uh, built for the Ruccioli family by Alberti. This is made of stone, has pilasters of all three column orders in order, very similar to the Colosseum. It also has arches or arched windows. Now, none of these are going to hold weight. They are all just decorative. And because of that, this is geometrically perfect with an emphasis on the horizontal and balanced uh, harmony of the building. For function, of course, it was domestic. It was their house, their palace. Uh, so that makes it power of the patron, but also this was built for a sense of civic pride, which means that the family was very proud of living in Florence at the time, and they wanted to beautify their city, so they commissioned this, uh, and also to rival the Medicis, because they were the other rival family in the city. Next, you're going to see the Madonna and Child with Two Angels by Fra Filippo Lippi. There's actually a poem written about him, side note. For form, this has no gold, which is differing from the medieval era, which we just got out of. Uh, that is very realistic, rounded and shaded. And Mary is not as sad or somber as the other Marys that we would have seen here in the medieval period or the pre-Renaissance. For function, this is power of the patron, which again was the Medicis, and it tells a religious story, the religious narrative of Mary, mother of Jesus. For content, because of that, we have Mary, Jesus, angels, and the halos. Don't forget the halos. They are still there, uh, kind of a leftover from medieval or pre-Renaissance era, but they're kind of uh, see-through and very wispy and not as golden, as heavy as the Byzantine stuff that we were looking at before. For context, this is the dawn of humanism and realism at the early Renaissance. 
Next, you're going to have The Birth of Venus by Sandro Botticelli. That is important. Remember his name. For form, this is a painting, and it is highly realistic. For function, this is a mythological narrative, obviously. It tells the story of Venus, who was born out of the sea as a fully formed adult. Zephyr, the wind who is blowing her on her shell over to the side of the ocean there on the beach. And the nymphs, which come to cover her in her nudity, because obviously she was just born. For context, you need to know that nude women are considered okay to paint as long as they are either mythological or educational. As a part of the early Renaissance, Botticelli chose this subject because it was appropriate and also because, I don't know, he just really loved her. It's kind of weird. Next, you're going to see The Last Supper by the famous or infamous Leonardo da Vinci, yes, of the Da Vinci Code. For form, this is a non-traditional fresco, which means that it was a fresco that was not painted in the way that typically they were painted. Da Vinci was kind of experimenting with that. And because of that, we almost cannot tell what it was originally meant to look like uh, it's because it's falling apart. Also, the building has been bombed during World War II and barely survived. Jesus' feet have been cut out of the picture. Just very torn up picture poor thing uh, and it does incorporate linear perspective or trompe l'oeil which means trick of the eye which make, makes it look like the painting is actually an extension of the room and that there is actually space back there which of course is an illusion for function it this would have appeared in a dining room and actually still does uh, as a mural above where monks would eat so that the monks could sit and feel like they were part of the spiritual story and feel like they were connected or more connected to Jesus and the disciples. For content, you do have the Last Supper narrative, which is Jesus and the disciples, and Christ tells them that one of them is going to betray him, and they all say, is it me, Lord? Is it me? And for context, that emotion, the anxiety or the sadness or the, the urgency of these people in this story was very much shown because da Vinci was a great humanist. He was a big believer in painting emotions on the face and on the body, how they would really actually look. Next, you're gonna have Adam and Eve by Albrecht Dürer. And this is an etching, also known as an engraving. That means when you take a metal plate and carve an image into it, and then that creates a print, which you can publish or create over and over again using a printing press. For function, this is a religious narrative. And for content, this has the artist's name in it. it has Adam and Eve, the first peoples and the animals in the forest, and they're in the Garden of Eden before they were expelled, and everything is hunky-dory, and we're all happy, and then there's the snake, and oh crap, then we got kicked out. So for context, this is German Renaissance. You do need to know that Dürer is the most famous of the German Renaissance artists. And the focus here is on science and proportion. So he doesn't worry about looking at things how they actually are. And instead, he kind of gives that nod back to perfect proportions of uh, the, the Greek statues. Uh, it also incorporates new technology. So tradition and change, maybe. That new technology is going to be the print uh, and the printing press, obviously, but especially that etching or engraving form. Next up, you're going to see number 75, the Sistine Chapel Michelangelo. This does include the ceiling frescoes and several of the walls, as you learned this week by that essay we had to write. Ugh. For form, we have, of course, frescoes, which are painted right onto the wall. The entire chapel is painted. It is kind of cool to say that our cafeteria is within a few feet of being the exact portions of the Sistine Chapel, so it's very large. For function, power of the patron. The patron here is the church or the pope, and of course, all of those religious narratives, including the creation of Adam and the story of the flood and all of these other things. So you can include that under content. But you also need to know about the Sibyls, which are mythic figures borrowed from, from Greek or Roman mythology and incorporated into the Sistine Chapel narrative or iconographic program, what have you, uh, as kind of that representation of Renaissance ideals. We're going to use your ideas. We're going to add some Christian narrative. We're going to take from your mythological stuff, and then we're going to mix it all up, and it's going to be this combination of classical and humanist elements, and we're going to call it the Sistine Chapel. It's going to be great. Next, you're going to see The School of Athens by Raphael. Now, interestingly enough, Raphael was working on this about two blocks from where the Sistine Chapel at the Sistine Chapel Michelangelo was working. For form, this is a fresco, and it's very large, and it would hang above uh, some of the shelves in the library at the Vatican, which means it was like the Pope's library. So that was its function. It's almost decoration. 
for content. Uh, Raphael used his models or friends to represent the classical thinkers. So they're supposed to be like Aristotle and Aristophanes and all of these people, but they're actually Leonardo, Michelangelo, and all these other, you know, even his self-portrait is in it there on the right-hand side. For context, you need to know that this is a high Renaissance nod to the classics, obviously, and it meant that the classical thinkers, such as Aristotle, uh, he wanted their wisdom to kind of seep into the books in the library and make the Pope really smart in the way that the Greeks and Romans were. Next, you're going to have the Isenheim altarpiece by Grunwald. This is the one that we didn't actually go over in class. You were supposed to read about it. This is oil on wood. Uh, obviously, it's a religious narrative of the crucifixion, but this is a nine foot tall by 10 foot long, massive painting. Uh, if you look at Christ on the cross in this one, there's something special about him. He looks sickly, right? And this would be shown to sick people, uh, but they were in a hospital that was very, very, very specific, which involved something called ergot poisoning. And ergot poisoning is when you eat something that has a fungus growing on it that is the same fungus that LSD is made out of. So not only do you have this terrible sickness which pretty much eats your skin off, you're also hallucinating at the same time. And then you look over and you see this, this crucifixion and this Christ who is dying on the cross and oh my gosh, he looks just like you because you're dying and you're sick. And so it's kind of that connection with the sick people and this attempt to convert them or this attempt to make them feel closer to Christ by representing him looking just like them. This disease was also called St. Anthony's Fire, and it killed a lot of people. Uh, and this is now brought out on special occasions now in festivals and uh, just for the priests and the monks and what have you. Next, you're going to see number 78, the Entombment of Christ. Pontormo is the artist that you need to know here. He is pretty important. For form, this is the new style called Mannerism. You need to know that. It's why it's in here. It has lots of pastel colors. It looks very crowded. They look off balance. The angels look like they're going to fall over. There's no sense of weight. It's almost weightless. For function, this is the religious narrative of them bringing Christ's body down off the cross. Uh, Mary is in the back looking very sad, like she's about to faint. And it would have appeared above an altar, so it's an altar piece. Obviously, it belongs in a church. For content, you need to know about the angels and Mary and dead Jesus. And for context, don't forget about mannerism. So mannerism sometimes is grouped with the high renaissance, but you need to be able to tell that it is different. Uh, even though these people were living and working at the same time, mannerists kind of took a different approach to painting the body. They didn't feel like they needed to paint it exactly completely correct and they took some liberties with that which kind of resulted in mannerism a style in which our bones are stretching or we're breaking our foot to stand a certain way next you're going to have the allegory of law and grace by lucas cronache the elder for law and grace this one is a wood cut and this one that you have in here are is uncolored However, most are colored prints. Um, it has two sides, the right and the left, and because it's a woodcut, it's very simplified. For function, this went with the Protestant Revolution, which remember, it was started by Martin Luther, and for content, you have that narrative of heaven and hell. If you follow the Catholics, you're gonna go to hell. If you follow the Protestant Revolution, you're gonna go to heaven. For context, woodcuts were easily distributed uh, due to the new technology of the printing press, and the artist worked with Martin Luther himself to actually create this to better illustrate his ideas of the Reformation. And they would distribute this as part of propaganda to get people to convert. Next, you're gonna have the Venus of Urbino by Titian, very important form. This is oil on canvas, and this was made by using glazes, which was a new technology used with oil paint, which gives the people like that glow, that inner glow that you always want as a female. So for function, this was made, they think, to be the, a gift to a young wife. And for content, you have Venus, obviously. You have two people in the background who aren't looking at you. They're completely ignoring her, but she's staring right at you, drawing you in with that gaze. It's very provocative, and it's kind of attention-grabbing. There is a nod to mannerism here and the fact that her body is somewhat disproportionate, but this is usually considered just kind of a touch of mannerism and not full-fledged on light port pontormo. For context, it is not okay to paint nudes unless they are mythological or educational, right? Still looking at Venus by Botticelli, so it's still not okay to do this unless this person is a Venus. So that's why Titian decided he was going to call her Venus, whether she was or not, we don't know. And this is part of the High Renaissance. 
Next, you're going to have the frontispiece of the Codex Mendoza. Now, remember, the Codex Mendoza is a book. The frontispiece is the cover. For function, you have that this is a narrative of the Aztecs, but it's for the conquering Spaniards. So this was created in Mexico, but it was created for the people who were conquering the Mexicans. It was not created for the Aztecs themselves. For content, you have a cactus and an eagle in the middle, which if you remember from our other unit was the symbol that that's where Mexico City should be. Uh, it has priests and traditional patterns and symbols and these traditional ways of representing people, but it is really, really important that you know about this work hint 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 because you it represents time in a unique way because it's representing the aztec history and the aztec time but in a way which is geared towards the at the time the modern spaniards so it's kind of weird so think about the way that the aztecs would represent their time and their selves and their history to each other and then think about the way that it's represented here it's kind of really interesting hint 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 so for context of course this is power of the patron and tradition and change because you have colonialism and anytime we have colonialism it's tradition and change Next up, you're going to have Il Gesu, including the triumph in the name of Jesus ceiling fresco. So Il Gesu is the name of the church, right? For form, this is a cross floor plan. It looks like a cross from above. It has a dome on top of the intersection of the two parts of the cross. For function, triumph in the name of Jesus uh, is another word for Il Gesu or the church. Uh, this is a Jesuit church. Uh, it's the first one. You do need to know that. For content, you have the fresco on the ceiling and these different carvings all around and stucco and gold and gold and extra gold. And for context, this is the rise of Baroque. Remember that Baroque is the style that is very, very extra. It's considered after the Renaissance. If anything has extra, extra everything and gold and just elaborate, that is what Baroque means. Next, you're going to have Hunters in the Snow by Peter Bruegel the Elder. Don't get him confused with Peter Bruegel the Younger. Uh, for form, this is an oil painting, but it's one of a set. For function, the, your set would have been 12 paintings representing the, tw the, ooh, the set would have been 12 paintings representing the four different seasons. Um, this also has the power of the patron because the patron is the guy that commissioned it. However, you don't need to know who that guy was. For content, this is the joy and the hardship of winter. It has atmospheric perspective, which means that it has mountains in the background as opposed to something in the foreground. And this is Northern Renaissance. Next, you're going to have the Mosque of Selim II. This is the mosque and all the trimmings, which means your dome and your minarets and your qibla and your makarnas and the, all of that stuff that you're supposed to know already. For function, this was power of the patron and also religious space. For content, you have stone and brick and gold, which that can go also go under form. Those two are interchangeable. For context, this is located in a city called Edirne, which is the center of trade and arrival of Istanbul. So this mosque was kind of meant to be the anti-Hagia Sophia, or the rival to Hagia Sophia at the time. Next, you're going to have the calling of St. Matthew by Caravaggio. This is the best example of chiaroscuro, which means light, dark, and the Baroque style that we have here. For function, this is a religious narrative, and it was meant to be highly emotional and draw the viewer in. For content, you have the story of Matthew, who is a tax collector, and he's sitting there counting his money, and Jesus comes in and says, hey, Matthew, follow me, and Matthew becomes one of the disciples. For content, or for, sorry, for context, you need to know that this is part of the Catholic Counter-Reformation, but it didn't start that way. So originally, Caravaggio was ridiculed for being too highly emotional and too provocative, and then eventually the Catholic Church had kind of adopted his style in a way to kind of lure people back in with the humanity and the emotion and the drama of Bible stories. For number 86, you're going to have Henry IV receives the portrait of Marie de Medici from the Marie de Medici cycle by Peter Paul Rubens. This is a series of oil paintings, even though we only see one in the 250, you do need to know it's part of a set. For function, it makes Marie de Medici look good, and she is the patron. So power of the patron for content, this one has Marie's portrait uh, being presented to Henry IV of France. He's surrounded by angels, and the woman in the middle represents France personified, and he has the gods, Zeus and Hera, and all of these symbols, and the whole world is coming together to make Marie look just amazing, and France is going to love her, and the gods approve. And Marie was exiled from court. I don't think we covered that actually in class, but she had these uh, paintings made for her also because, you know, she was just crazy like wanted herself to look good and her life to be a fairy tale but she wanted herself to look better 
because she actually got kicked out of court. So she's like, um, I think I'll just make this and I'll make myself look really good and then I can be popular again. Uh, so she was part of a Baroque fashion and style. You can tell by the clothes that are in the picture and also because she's just the definition of extra. Next, you're going to have self-portrait with Saskia by Rembrandt. And Saskia is Rembrandt's wife. So for form, this is an etching or an engraving, just like Durer would have done. For function, this is the portrait of the artist as an artist, which is very rare. It's the first one that we see in the 250. It's also a marriage portrait, a private portrait. It was not meant for everybody to see. It was just meant for Rembrandt and his wife so that they could look at it together. For content, obviously Rembrandt and Saskia. And for context, this is a unique picture, especially for Rembrandt. Even though he did do a lot of etchings, most people know him as uh, the, the painter who uses white uh, Rembrandt toothpaste. So this is pretty interesting. Next, you're going to have San Carlo alla Quattro Fontaine by Francesco Borromini. And Quattro Fontaine means four fountains. So for form, you're going to have four fountains in a very cramped space in a corner of Rome. And for function, this is a Trinitarian church. So it's a religious space. For content, you have a dome and a facade and then all the decorations of the inside, a completely white interior, which allows the light to play and reflect off of those really just Baroque, carvings and extra you know shapes and everything up in the dome it's very much uh, geometric and math like but also has kind of an organic feel like a honeycombs almost like the mucarnas so it's very just very highly decorated and very skilled for context the artist did this for free which gave him the freedom to express himself in that skill and remember that all of that extra extra everything just over the top is going to be baroque next you're going to have the ecstasy of saint Teresa by bernini uh, for form this is made of gold and marble and stucco and it's all put together and she is extremely emotional and realistic you also have the patrons on the side by the way who are looking down and watching this scene unfold below them. For function, this is a religious narrative. You do need to know the story of uh, St. Teresa's dream. It's also an altarpiece, belongs in the front of the church, and is power of the patron, as you could see with the patrons built into the side. For content, it has a story of her, has a patrons, da 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 For context, this is Baroque. It was not well received. The patrons did not like it and tried to have it removed, but they couldn't. Uh, and you need to know that the artist used to design stage sets. So that's how he gets kind of this dramatic, kind of deep stage setting that we see here. Next, you're going to have Angel with Arquebus. Um, and this is attributed to the master of Calamarca. We don't really know his name, but that's the artist. So for form, this is oil on canvas, shows power of the Spaniards in Mexico. Uh, we went over this all in class. He's an angel, but he's also a soldier, and Arquebus is the gun. He has a mannerist kind of stance in that he's very androgynous. Is it a girl? Is it a boy? Neither. It's an angel. Uh, so his stance is a little bit off. He looks top heavy. He looks like he's going to topple over. He would have to be weightless or floating in order to stand on that weird shaped leg there at the bottom. And he's covered in Baroque clothing. Look how elaborate that is. And for your context, you need to know kind of that the Spaniards presented this as a propaganda piece. Like, look at us. We have the power of the angels behind us. Oh, we're angels with guns. Maybe they are angels, and they're obviously they're rich because we can't afford these guns, and maybe the guns are magic. I've never seen a gun before, and look at their clothing. They must have lots of money. So we are, as Mexicans, being conquered, both impressed by these people and also terrified of them. Next, you're going to have Las Maninas by Diego Velasquez. And this is an oil on canvas, a painting. It incorporates chiaroscuro, which remember is high contrast, light and dark. For function, this is power of the patron. It was painted for the king. And for content, you're gonna have the king's daughter, uh, the princess and her attendants. You also have the painter himself on the left-hand side there. He is a painting a self-portrait, a portrait of the artist as an artist. For context, this is informal and personal. Uh, it's not, it's, they're doing things. They're kind of just posing in the room. It's not as if they were posing like for a photograph like you would today look, looking very stiff. Um, and on a side note, the family that he was painting was notoriously inbred. 
So they were like really ugly and deformed. But the artist hides this by giving them these very fancy clothes and presenting them in a busier setting so that you don't really notice how basically ugly they were. Next, you're going to have Woman Holding a Balance by Vermeer. Vermeer was a master of the Northern Renaissance. You should be able to identify a Vermeer because all of his oil on canvas paintings have the light slanting in from a window either on the left or the right hand side, usually from the left. For function, these all have possible religious messages, and they're all representative of Holland, which means that they have like fashion and they're saying something about the people there. Uh, so for your religious message here, you have a woman who's holding a balance and she's balancing her worldly things, which are on the table in front of her, which means that she may be thinking about the balance between her worldly life and her spiritual life, her items that belong to her on earth and her eternal soul. Number 93, the palace at Versailles. Uh, this is in France, obviously. In the French country, Versailles was meant to be a hunting lodge for the king, the Sun King Louis XIV, but it turned into the definition of Baroque architecture, all right? This is huge, massive palace with so many floors and so many rooms and so many windows and like twice the number of bathrooms as the White House has, or three times, I don't know, it's a lot. So this is covered in gold and it has gardens all around and it has the Hall of Mirrors, which is important. It's just elaborate. And for your content, you're going to have all of that, including like the different halls and the thrones and the rooms and all of this. For context, this is showing the wealth of France. So that Baroque French style, which was the most Baroque of all of the Baroque styles, was meant to show off that France was a powerful force in the art world. And they could do that because they were rich and they had lots of money. And it was kind of a sense of pride with the French. Next, you're going to have the screen with the Siege of Belgrade and the hunting scene. This is a folding screen, which is made of fabric. You can fold and unfold it and move it around the room. Uh, that makes it a decoration of the residence or a room. Uh, so power of the patron. For content, you have two sides. A hunting scene, which is like the peaceful side, and a battle scene, which is the war side. And the battle is the war of the Habsburgs and or something. For context, uh, you need to know that the war side, the battle side, would be shown to men who were coming into the salon for maybe political meetings, and it would kind of uh, intimidate them and say, like, hey, we are warlike, and, you know, we're going to beat you or whatever. And the peace side would have been for women, so maybe the queen is having somebody to come in for tea, and they need, like, a pretty picture to be, you know, to look at while they're drinking their little tea. So two different functions. Compare this to the two other-sided works. Um, that have maybe a war and a peace side. Next, you're going to have The Virgin of Guadalupe by Gonzalez. This is a painting, but it also has different stones on it, pearls and gems. For function, it's a religious narrative, and for content, you have Mary, Mother of Jesus. It's all about context on this one, guys. So the supposed miraculous creation of this work happened when a priest wandered into the, the desert, and like an angel came down, and Mary appeared to him, and then she like, left this piece of art there or something um, just like kind of a miraculous coming from the sky work of art so people still make pilgrimages to see this art because they believe that story um, and that's totally fine but it's that's why it's so famous and kind of repeated over and over why it's in the 250 is because it combines all of that plus traditional Mexican arts with Asian materials like pearls Due to trade, and remember because of Spain were colonizing Mexico, that's where we get all of these items for. So it shows really good tradition and change. Next, you're going to have Fruit and Insects by Rachel Roish, my namesake. This is an oil on canvas, and it combines science and art, a very popular subject at the time, which is a still life with flowers. This has different seasons of fruits, um, and her paintings often do. They have fruits from, like, that would bloom or be harvested in August, and then other ones that would bloom or be harvested in, like, February. So it's kind of a combination, which is pretty impressive, um, and it's highly detailed. This is the Northern Renaissance, and this is going to transition us into the beginning of the scientific revolution at a time when we are combining not only politics and art or maybe anatomy and art, but also all of these new scientific discoveries and scientific ways of thinking with art, which transcends us to the Industrial Revolution after that. 
Last, you're going to have Spaniard and Indian produce a mestizo, which is attributed to Juan Rodriguez Juarez. Uh, form, you need to know that this is a casta painting, so it comes as a set. Uh, for function, this is to warn people about the mixing of races in colonial Spain. You have a Spanish man on the right, an indigenous woman on the left, a baby in the middle, and a servant. So it's kind of telling people back in Spain, like, hey guys, look what's happening over here. Do we like this? I don't know. How do we feel about this? And generally, people felt like that was probably a bad idea. Um, because of that, the focus on this is colonialism, tradition and change, and also power of the patron, which is obviously the Spaniards. Um, this is one of many casta paintings. So if you were shown another casta painting, you would probably need to know the name of this and know why it was painted and what the message was. All right, guys, sorry this is coming out so late, but I hope you at least listen to what you need to and study. Remember that you need to know about the Aztecs and the Aztec history of the Codex Mendoza as opposed to another way the Aztecs would represent time. So let me know if you need any more help. I know it's kind of late, but good luck on your test.